Um, it is my absolute pleasure to introduce my friend, Dr. Maria Sirwa. As our keynote speaker today, uh, she's a resilience expert, a positive psychologist, an author, an inspirational speaker. She makes me cry, she makes me laugh out loud, um, and I'm so happy that she was willing to uh, come and share with us today her research, um, stories, wisdom, uh, just to talk about how this moment of upheaval can, if we choose, elevate our capacities to hold both the terrible and the good in such a way that we become individually and communally stronger. And that's what it's all about. Is Maria with us? There she is. Hi, Maria. Hi, Liana. <laughs> Thanks for having me. You are welcome. And I, just to let the audience know, um, Maria is going to take questions as part of her presentation. And we just ask that the members of the audience use the Q&A function and the questions will queue up and then we will take a couple of breaks during Maria's presentation to answer those questions and we'll bring you in as a panelist live so that you can ask your question of Maria. And um, I think those will come in the order in which they were received. So um, thanks everyone for being here. Thank you, Maria, for being here and take it away. Hi, everyone. I'm so glad we get to be together in this form. Of course, it would have been lovely to be together in another form, but such is the time we are in. Just recently, I met a gentleman named Rob Fazio, who told me the following story. During the days following 9-11, he, he was in graduate school um, in psychology in Virginia and kept flying back up to Manhattan carrying with him a, a sketch of his father and photographs of his father asking people on the streets, have you seen this man? Have you seen this man? Because his father worked in the South Tower and no one had heard from him since the days the plane had hit. And during that three week period between 9-11 and the day that he learned formally that his father had passed in the towers, Rob was bereft and shocked and motivated and activated. And in one visit back to Virginia to meet with his dissertation advisor, Mr. And Dr. Anderson, he asked Dr. Anderson, you know, when I'm in New York on the streets holding the pictures of my father and crying, or when I'm back here and I'm okay and I'm working on my classwork, is what is am I strong like is one of them strong and Dr. Anderson said yes strong in both places and that I think is the territory in which we are all finding ourselves now right the capacity to move forward get our work done continue the efforts build community together hold fast and at the same time experience the incredible flood of emotions and worries and anxiety and fatigue that comes along with COVID-19 and what I'm now calling COVID fatigue. Um, so the conversation that I have for you today is a presentation that is about resilience, but resilience oriented specifically to how we cultivate an inner capacity so that we can continue to hold all that we're here to hold. When um, Rob learned of his father's passing. He actually learned through a colleague of his dad's who said that the thing that his dad did and the reason he passed in the towers was because he was holding the door for everyone to leave. And then when he realized that some of the people in the back of the office didn't know what was happening, he ran to the back of the office, held open the back door so that everyone could leave. And sadly, he himself did not make it out. Rob since founded an organization in his father's honor called Hold the Door. And that is who you are and what you do. So before I go any further, thank you for the thousands of ways hidden and seen that you hold the door for so many. I'm going to share my screen now and we will dive a little bit into the territory of resilience and um, this notion of how we hold it all, the good and the bad, 
really starts with a foundational perspective that Emerson brought to our awareness. This is hell, and we're all experiencing a little bit of hell right now, right? Our fatigue, our worry, our anxiety, our anger, our frustration, our awareness of injustice, our um, love, our sense of appreciation, all of that is tainted now by the world of COVID. And yet, as Emerson reminded us, that our experience of living really has to do with perspective, that we can be in the same world and hold it more as hell or a little more as heaven. And everything I'm going to teach you today is about this capacity to hold both the sense of heaven while hell is present. And to do so, I'd like you to just focus on a particular metaphor. This is an art form that emerged from Japan in the 15th century called Kintsugi. And the form is that of repairing a bowl that has been broken and now lining it in the fractured places with golden lacquer. So the practices, the, the resilience building practices that I'm going to dive into now really have to do with this uh, layering in the golden lacquer, even as we feel the fractures within ourselves and the fractures within the systems that we are participating in. So if you can hold this metaphor, this image in mind as we move forward. We're going to practice immediately. So three things I am looking forward to is um, a, a positive psychology based intervention that emerged from research by a woman named Dina Nir in Israel. And what she understood is that one way to mitigate pessimism or anxiety is to actually focus on things that we're looking forward to. So I'd like you to type into the chat now, aim for three, but we'll do this pretty quickly, at least one or two things you are looking forward to tomorrow. So one or two things you are looking forward to tomorrow. So if you could just type those in the chat. Day two of the summit, yes, and a little sun, gardening, yoga, nourishing neighbors, a sunny day. I'm not sure what view view Yuli is, but awesome, whatever that is. Day two. Gardening, art, gardening, walking. Yes. Okay, opening of some of Massachusetts. Yay, making art, beautiful, embracing family and friends. Excellent. So what Dr. Near found is that when we actually record three things I'm looking forward to tomorrow, a few things happen. So this is a simple exercise. You, excuse me, you do it in the morning. You just write down three things I'm looking forward to. So number one, when we actually look forward into the near future, pessimism decreases and anxiety begins to decrease because in some way we're reminding ourselves we have a little bit of control over the future. That's number one. Number two, what starts to happen is when we realize I've only got maybe one thing to look forward to, but we, we're supposed to have three for the homework, we automatically start adding in the things that we want to look forward to. And so we literally prioritize them in our days. And when we start prioritizing the things that actually we can look forward to, we actually shape our neurochemistry in the direction of optimism we feel a little more hopeful, and there's a little more vitality. So even if you have a brutal, work-filled, uh, stress-filled day, if there are three tiny moments you have to look forward to during that day, you're going to experience the day as a little bit more heaven, a little less hell. So our first practice has to do with just each morning, simply wake up, Note three things I'm looking forward to. Now, some of us are sheltering with others. I have five young adults in the house who've been with us for nine weeks. Notice how my eyes are getting wide as I say that. <sighs> this is a tool that you can easily teach young people in your home. Just by over that first, you know, bowl of breakfast cereal or that first dish of eggs and bacon or whatever, what are three things you're looking forward to tomorrow? And just begin to get others in the habit of looking forward with appreciation. At its essence, this is like gratitude in the future. Okay, so that's practice number one. 
Practice number two is self-care. Self-care in this moment is without question, absolutely fundamentally mandatory. It is not a luxury, it is mandatory. COVID-19 brings with it, in addition to grief, upheaval, loss, financial stress, it brings to us a relentless uncertainty. We are aware that this is a marathon and because of the marathonic, I think I just made that word up, nature of this event, we have to be in the position to con continuously care for ourselves. So there are three questions that drive us toward a little mm, better self-care each day. The first question is what nourishes me? The second question is what strengthens me? And the third question is what inspires me? And the practice again is to consciously, mindfully each day, ask ourselves one of those questions. So the first thing I want you to do is ask yourself, which question feels the most gifting, gifting to me today? Calming, strengthening, or inspiring? Which one of those do I wanna focus on? And then what I'd like you to do is just type in a quick answer. We don't need to know if, it, if, if the activity is gonna be calming, strengthening, or inspiring. That's up to you, but just type in one thing that you could do that would be an act of self-care today. It'll be either calming or strengthening or, or uh, inspiring. Yeah, I know. Washing my hair, music, yoga, writing to friends, real letters, right? Reading something funny, going for a walk, outdoor time. Excellent. Great. I love the variety. So notice the particularity. What serves you is going to be unique and particular to you, number one. Number two, notice as you're reading the chat, these do not require an extraordinary investment in time or energy or finances. The things that soothe us, that inspire us, and that strengthen us often can be activated in a short amount of time. What it requires is the mindful attention to ask ourselves those three questions. I've put those three questions on my bathroom mirror so that each morning, even though there are a million things to do and Lord knows a million people to take care of, I have them front and center when I wake up. What nourishes me, what strengthens me, what inspires me. Just think of it as oxygen for the psyche, oxygen for the heart and the mind. In order to do what you have chosen to do, you have chosen to put yourselves in the position of communal care. And because of that choice, you have put yourself in the position of being witness always to suffering, to injustice, to need, and to possibility. And in order to stay in that place of possibility, which is where heaven exists, we have to, the, have, to have the capacity to tolerate the need and the suffering and the injustice. And in order to do that, to hold both, we must be full within ourselves. Self-care is the territory in which we fill ourselves in order that we may bring forward whatever we're here to bring forward. It is without question mandatory. So practice one is about looking forward. Practice two is about shaping the day as it is. We're gonna look at one more thing and then we'll open it up for Q and A. So the third tool practice I wanna to suggest to you is how oh, practicing the and. Now this is where we wanna take our minds a little bit out of hell, a little more into heaven. So I just want you to um, type in either yes or no to these questions. Have you found yourself recently jumping to a conclusion? Anybody? Yes or no? Has anybody found themselves taking anything personally recently? Have you found yourself catastrophizing? Um, have you, has there been a moment recently when your emotions have clouded your judgment? 
Has there been a moment when you have acted out of anger or defensiveness and you've externalized, meaning you weren't so comfortable taking responsibility yourself, you sort of put it out in the world. Like if only we had a better so-and-so, this would be better, yeah. Um, has anybody ever um, maximized the negative input coming your way and minimized the positive? Okay. So a lot of yeses, some no's. These are common negative thought habits. We all have them. The Dalai Lama has them. The problem with these common negative thought habits, and if you're like me, you, um, you um, have a number of them and they cascade together. The problem with common negative thought habits is that they don't just stay in the territory of thought. You see, when we jump to conclusions or we take things personally, or when our emotion, emotions cloud our judgment, they then trigger negative emotions, which then triggers often non-resilient behavior. Non-resilient behavior looks like armoring up. It looks like becoming numb. It looks like blame and shame. It looks like um, being flooded and overwhelmed. So, so many, um, it creates, these negative thoughts create this negative downward spiral. So we want to bring our minds to better places. We don't want to deny the, that we've had these thoughts because that's just part of humanity. Our brains are hardwired for the negative, but we don't want to stay there either. So we want to build in what we call the beautiful and. So imagine. One of the thoughts I've been having recently, and I'll be curious to know if you guys have had this, is even though I'm working extremely hard, I have this fear that I'm not doing enough, right? That's my negative thought. So I wanna acknowledge my negative thought, I'm not doing enough. That's a combination of sort of jumping to a conclusion and taking things personally at the same time. Then we wanna build in the and, so you wanna add the and. And then on the other side of the end, you want to think of a new thought that has two characteristics to it. It is slightly positive and it's true, meaning I believe it and it leads me in a positive direction. So to my thought, I'm not doing enough, I could say I'm not doing enough or I'm worried that I'm not doing enough or I'm anxious that I'm not doing enough and I'm making progress each day. I'm not doing enough and I know I can get help. I'm not doing enough and I can call a friend and see if they're having the same experience, right? There are a number of things I could say on the other side of the and. Okay, here's what I'd like you to do now. Now, this takes a little courage. I'd like you to type in a negative thought that you might be having recently. It could be about yourself, could be about the world. Something like, this is never gonna get better or, um, I'm a terrible mom, or like me, I'm not doing enough, right? So just a negative thought that just kind of repeats itself in your head. We've got one, I talk too much, right? There you go. A little self-criticism. I'm worried about the kind of world my grandchildren will have. I can't do it all. I could be doing more, and I should be doing more. We're never going to see normal again. My cat's gonna get eaten by a fox. I know, we're terrified, right? I'm anxious about my presentation. I'm not enough. Excellent, excellent, I'm too harsh. You guys are awesome. Now I'd like you to type in the word and. Just type in the word and. And on the other side of the and, you're just looking for one sentence or one phrase that's slightly positive and true. It doesn't even have to address the negative thought directly, just slightly positive and two. I have a lot, uh, I talk too much and I have a lot to say, and I can still get a lot done, and I can get some of it done, and we can get outside, and my children are strong and resilient, and I don't have to be the expert, exactly, Jennifer and I can slow down and think, for, beautiful. This is exactly what we're looking for. Now, here's why this is so important, and then we're gonna open up the Q&A. 
when we have those negative thoughts, they trigger negative emotions, which then trigger often non-resilient behavior. When we build in the and, what we're creating is what Dr. Rivich from Penn calls cognitive flexibility. We're building a mind that is capable of both holding it heaven and hell. And that's where resilience lives. It doesn't live in the denial of the negative because it's real. We are worried about these things. Bad things are happening. We don't have control over a lot. You don't wanna deny reality, that's not resilient. But we don't wanna stay stuck in the, own, the, the negative only perception of reality because these other thoughts are also real. I can do something, I can still get things done, I can slow down first, I have things to share, and I don't have to be the expert. That's also real, that's the heaven side. So this cognitive flexibility not only brings us to a better place mentally, not only does it increase our optimism and our energy, we have more energy on the other side of the end, it creates within us an awareness of choice. Building in the end is the stance of personal leadership. It takes us out of any victim mentality or martyrdom into a stance of resilient leadership. So I'm going to pause there now. We've talked so far about three things I'm looking forward to tomorrow. We've talked about three questions that activate self-care, and we've talked about now what to do with negative thought habits. So would anyone like to, um, Liana, can they unmute themselves? or can we see them on video to ask a question or just even a reflection of what we've talked about so far, how this might be useful to you. Hey, Maria, this is PJ. There's no questions just yet. Um, oh. I'll, I have a question here for my name. Eileen, we're gonna bring you in on audio video. You didn't have to bring me in. You could have just asked my question. Hi, Maria. Hi. My question, I loved everything you said. And um, my question was, is it a little like dialectic thinking? Two congregate thoughts can exist. It sounds like an evolution of that because you're going more positive, where in dialectic you hold something negative. So maybe you could talk a little about that. You know, I don't really know what that is, so I can't answer with okay. any kind of awareness <laughs> or, or truth to it because I don't know. Right. What I do know, however, what we're looking, and you can then tell me if it makes sense relative to what you know, what we're looking to do is to increase the capacity to hold paradox. So yes. paradox is two seemingly opposite truths being true at the same time, mm -hmm. right? And resilient folk hold paradox. That's that, that's that image of the broken and whole bowl, right? We can hold both. So this is hell and this is heaven at the same time. I feel overwhelmed and I have capacity that both right. are true. So if the dialectical stuff enables you to hold paradox, yes, then they're very much similar. The exact same thing. I don't like Zoom, but I love it because it connects me to the outside world. Both yes. of those things exist. So can you then talk about a little as leaders, how we can help other people hold that paradox? Because yeah. that's a very uh, hard place to be. Yeah. So the first thing always is to practice the practice yourself. Now, what I like about the and practice is that you can practice it out loud. So literally, you can be at your kitchen sink, say, oh my God, I am so overwhelmed. I'm never going to get it all done. And then take a breath and out loud say, and I, I actually, you know, I, I get a lot done every day. And so the people like in your home space can hear you practicing the and out loud. With your teams, you can actually teach this. And you teach that same structure, negative thought and something positive and true. And as you're teaching it, the most important thing to note is that as you model it, the actual learning agility is going to increase dramatically. So the leadership modeling of these practices is the most important thing, number one. And then number two, it becomes a part of the shared lexicon of the organization.
No, I think that's great. And a great tip for people on these Zoom meetings when they're doing a team check-in to start saying, you know, let's think this way and write about it. Thank you very yeah. much. Thank you, Eileen. And what's important there to hold on to is we're not denying reality. We're not denying that we've just, you know, I'm not denying that I'm crazy about that I think I should be doing more when I'm working crazy hours already, right? That I like, I'm not denying that there's a little nutty going on in my head that I jump to conclusions and I take things personally. And I'm not allowing my neurochemistry to stay stuck there. I'm building a better brain that cultivates that capacity to hold both. All right, let's do a little more and then we'll break again for a question. So if, if Liana had said to me, I want you to talk about, I want you to, you only have three minutes and I want you to talk about two things. The two things I would have chosen to talk to you about were mandatory self-care and this notion connection. We know intuitively, you all know intuitively that connection makes a positive difference. We do not do well alone in good times. We certainly do not do well alone in difficult times. Now, in um, you know, a deepened like week-long resilience training, we would spend a lot of time talking about these three categories of connection. Mentors are the people who not only encourage our progress forward, but they hold us accountable for not slipping backwards, right? So in a time like this, my hope is that you are each in some way mentors to each other and or that you have mentors in the nonprofit world who are holding you accountable for your own capacity and providing that kind of trusting to support to not allow you to slip backwards. At every time in life, of course, we need experts, credentialed experts. We need the lawyers, the accountants, the therapists, the acupuncturists, you know, people who've been certified in a specialty. And what we most need right now is what I metaphorically call the choir. The choir are those people we deeply trust. What you see in this image is a photo of three women who I met. They were in a class of mine who went, they all turned 50 the same year. And that year they each had an ampersand tattooed on their forearm as a sort of communal tattoo bond or bonding moment in which they had, they agreed that, you know what, by 50, you kind of are who you are and we are capable of growing. We are who we are and we are capable of growing. So they are choir to each other. They are the people they call in the middle of the night when they're frightened and they're the people they call in the middle of the day when they're excited. What I'd like you to do now is take a moment and jot down, I'm not in the chat, but just for yourself, jot down who was in your choir today? Who can you deeply trust? We'll take a minute to do that. And um, I, maybe this is Kristen from YM. Hi, Kristen. I'll get, I, after we finish this choir piece, I will get to your question. So no worries there. So please just take a moment and jot down who is in my choir today. Who is in my choir today? We'll take another, you know, 30 seconds or so. Okay. Now I'm not going to ask you to share who was in your choir, but as I name these, um, sort of noticings of what choirs typically look like. If it's true for you, just type in yes, please. So some of you may have noticed that your choirs are a little larger than you realized. And so there's a, there's a kind of gratitude and appreciation like, wow, there's, there's, like, there's, a, there's a number of people I, I actually trust in the world. So if that's true for you, please type in a yes. And some of you may have noticed that your choirs are a little smaller 
than you would have liked them to be, that they maybe have shrunk over time, right? Note that during times of transition, our choirs do tend to get smaller, right? Things shift, things shift. Now, some of you um, may have noticed that your choir is predominantly family or only family. And some of you have, may have noticed that you, you have very few or no family at all. Your choir is all friends. Some of you may have noticed that your choir has people on it from a long time ago. And you know, you know if you called them today, they would be right there for you, right? Um, some of you may have noticed that you've got people who've passed on in your choir, that they were always in your choir and they're still in your choir, right? And some of you may have been inspired to include in your choir a furry four-footed friend, full permission to do so. Now this question, I would like everybody to type in either a yes or a no. Did you put your own name on your list? Please type in a yes or a no. Yeah. I'd like you to write your own name on your list, even if you feel like you're faking it. Why? You see, resilience is an inside job. The capacity to hold it all rests on our capacity to be a little bit more our own best friends which means to be wise about which practices we're going to invest in, like the practices of self-care, the practices of looking forward to tomorrow, the practices of moving our negative thought habits into a little bit more heaven. Resilient folk lead themselves into their days. They take the day, whatever the day is, an ordinary Thursday, an extraordinary Sunday, it doesn't matter. They take the day and they shape it in such a way that it serves them. Cultivating their strength, their energy, their vitality, and their optimism. In order to do so, we need to be in our own choir, which practically means we need to be able to consciously carve out a little time every single day to take care of ourselves whether that means recovery, whether that means inspiration, whether that means to strengthen ourselves. So this choir notion is absolutely foundational. Now, I wanna get back to the Wham question. And do we wanna, um, PJ, do we wanna unmute and invite, uh, I think it's Kristen probably, to share the question out with us? Sure, give us a sec here. It's in the chat. I'm going to momentarily here. Okay. It's a wonderful question. Hi. Hi. <laughs> I didn't realize I'd go on video. That's hilarious. <laughs> I'm out going for a beautiful walk while I listen to this fabulous speech. I love you so much, Maria. You're always so inspiring. Oh, oh thank you. So tell me a little so, bit more about your question. Well, it's kind of a vulnerable question. and I'm, I'm, uh, I'm sort of nervous to ask it because a lot of folks in our sector are really excited to reopen and really excited to get back to work. Um, and I mean, we've been working really, really hard at WAM, but there's also been a lot of silver linings around, to use an overused phrase, to um, home and having these flexible schedules and not commuting from meeting to meeting, like gratitude for the sicknesses going down, um, but sort of like not wanting to go back into that pace. So I'm putting myself out there and asking that question because I can't be alone in this, um, or maybe I am, but that's my question. Yeah, I doubt that you're alone in it. And you're actually naming a super important element of times of upheaval. So 
I would like you to think now of the journey of change, like, cause we're all in a moment of change. We're changing inside. Uh, I don't know if you, Alicia just supported your question. <laughs> we're changing inside the world is changing outside. And it, it change to, this is a model taught to me by Joan Borisenko is in the change happens in the shape of a smile, meaning something happens like COVID-19 and there's a descent into chaos. And in the descent, things that had been true are no longer true, but we're not yet on the other side yet, right? We're still emerging. This is where we are now. We're in, we're in a time still of uncertainty and experimentation. And so the new normal hasn't emerged yet a solid, stable new normal. We're going to have like a thousand normals, right? <laughs> Before yeah. we get to a stable normal, right? So in that space, think of the bottom of the smile or the bottom of the curve between what is no longer true and what is not yet true. That's where transformation happens. Mm. And in any time of upheaval, whether it's a loss of a human being, loss of a job, COVID-19, um, or, you know, the other moments of change when like young ones go off to college and empty nest happens or someone gets married. There's great learning in that, what Joan calls liminal space and time, right? So in that liminal space and time is great learning. Like you're learning that there's a benefit to slowing down. You're <laughs> learning that there's a benefit to not being in your car 24 seven, right? You're, so you're learning some important things that nourish you. And the, the last thing we want to do is learn something golden in, a t in that liminal space and then not apply it. Mm. So to your, absolutely, your perhaps ambivalence about opening is because there's a part of you that's a little tremulous about can I hold on to the gold uncovered? And the yeah. invitation always is yes is yes. Please do hold on yes. to the ways in which you have found that you are supporting yourself even more deeply and in order to serve the work forward, right? Mm -hmm. Because if slowing down actually builds energy for you, we need that. If slowing Thank down you. actually clarifies where your best visions are, like if creativity grows in slowing down, we need that, right? So whatever the gold is during this time, that's where heaven is. Bring that back out with you. Thank you, Maria. Thank you. Theory you. Yes, Wendy. Okay. Um, so let's generalize this learning now. In this time of change when we're between no longer and what is not yet what is no longer true and not yet true we have all lost so much right we there's so much we have lost resilient folk acknowledge this and they continue to move toward gain they what what we're gaining what we're learning what we're now willing to try willing to experiment with like a zoom summit right what we're now um you see because anytime chaos happens new possibilities emerge, new growths emerge. And the trick is to stay open to them within ourselves and around us so that we can take advantage of the ones that will be sustaining for us. Now, I have friends, my profession, I traveled before COVID-19. I was on a plane constantly and I was done with flying. And guess what? I'm done with sitting on my butt for eight hours a day, right? And so my new emerging normal, you know, universe willing, is that I will be more thoughtful about less flying and less sitting on my butt and more in between, right? Like more mix of how I do my work. I, I don't know what that's going to look like, but it's clear. I'm not going back to the old way where I was on a plane constantly and I am not staying here where I'm on my Zoom butt eight hours a day. Like there's gotta be something else, right? That's the invitation I'm asking of myself. I hope so for you as well. Okay, let's check in. Is there any other question at this time? I don't, I don't think I see anything else in the Q&A. Anything else somebody wants to type into the chat? 
and yes, we'll have one more question at the end, time for question at the end. Okay. Let me go back to the slide deck then. So we have a video now I want to show you. This is an example of resonant positive connection. Um, from I just, I invite you to just enjoy the audition. This is a Britain's Got Talent audition. And then what I'm going to tie this to is another important resilience learning. Hi, boys. Hi there. We are Calabro. Do you have day jobs? I'm a laborer. I'm a sales assistant on a petrol garage. I'm a kitchen salesman. I work in a Japanese restaurant. I work in a hospital. Okay, lovely. How long have you guys been a group? We've been together for about a month now. A month? Oh, not long. What makes you think after a month that you're good enough to win Britain's Got Talent? Natural chemistry, I think. Okay, lovely. Well, whenever you're ready. In the darkness, a fugitive running, fallen from God. Didn't expect this. Fallen from grace, God be my witness. I never shall yield till we come face to face. Till we come face to face. He knows his way in the dark. Mine is the way of the Lord. Those who follow the path of the righteous shall have their reward. And if they fall as Lucifer fell, a flame of sword. Stars in your multitude. Scarce to be counted, filling the darkness with order and light. You are the sentinels, silent and sure, keeping watch in the night, keeping watch in the night. You know your place in the sky. You hold your course and your reign And each of your seasons returns and returns And it's always the same And if you fall as Lucifer fell You fall in flames And so it must be for so See him safe behind bars. I will never rest. Till then, yes, I swear. Yes, I swear. I So I offer you that video just as a sort of mo momentary positivity break to underscore the beauty of connection. These five young gentlemen who got together a month ago to try something new. But I also offer it as an invitation into wonder. One of the things we have discovered from people in the darkest situations, war zones, um, imprisonment, Holocaust survivors, from the diaries and the research with people who've had 
um, experience the worst moments in life is that we grow relative to our capacity to allow the new and the good in. In other words, we are open to wonder. And so the last invitation I wanted to offer you has to do with seeking stories to consciously increase your attention to stories out there in the world, stories that elevate hope, stories that connect to the meaning that is so dearly resonant to you, and stories of exemplars, not just exemplars in your particular field like theater or arts or music or museum collections, but exemplars of humanity. The photograph you're looking at right now is a woman named Janine Shepherd. She's an Australian woman who was an Olympic uh, cross-country skier, and she was on a training run just two weeks before the Italian Olympics were to take place. Uh, she was doing her final bike ride in Australia before the team was flying out to Italy. And um, the next thing she knew, she woke up in hospital. A uh, truck had hit her and catapulted her into a shattered spinal cord, multiple organ failure. She was told by the physician she would probably never walk again. She had, um, had to have blood transfusions for days, went into coma, experienced six months in spinal ward, and you know faced suicidality. She returns home eventually with a full body brace and catheter bag. And she's now living with her parents because she can't quite take care of herself. And she makes the decision to live. She has no idea what her life is going to be, but she makes the decision to live. And one day as she, after she's made this decision, she's seeing herself sit in the chair, knowing that she probably won't ever walk again. And she sees an airplane, airplane fly above her. And she thinks to herself, hmm, I can't walk but maybe I can fly. She calls up the airfield that day, books a flying lesson, and short story, she becomes over time a pilot, a trick plane pilot, a Qantas large jet pilot, and then an instructor of pilots. And her story and her, she has a gorgeous TED talk, her example has been so astonishingly inspiring to the peoples of Australia that she was recently given the Order of Australia which is that country's highest award. So to take time out in the evening, much of what I've discussed today is practices I encourage you to do during the day, but to take time out in the evening to gather around you the stories that connect to the meaning of your lives, that elevate hope in you, and that bring forward those who are the exemplars in the world in the way in which you would like to show up. We have just a couple of minutes left. Are there any remaining questions or even a reflection that you might wanna share about this material? You're welcome, I mean. It doesn't look like there are any questions, so I will leave you with a final story. Thank you, thank you. In 1666, the world looked somewhat like it looks now, oh, in one way only. And that was that the bubonic plague had hit Europe and was decimating Europe heading into England. As it reached the southern cities of England, people in the north began to be petrified that they too would be decimated. And a small village about 35 miles outside of Manchester called Iam decided that they could do something about this. What they decided to do was gather together, this was under the guidance of their rector, and make a decision that they would face the bubonic plague with dignity and with generosity. And as a community of 300 strong, they built a border wall around their town 
so that no stranger would come in. They put coins in the border stone so that tradespeople could come and leave goods and food for them so that they wouldn't starve. And they made the decision as the entire village that no stranger would be allowed in so that they would cause no harm. And anyone who became ill in town would be cared for and die in the arms of someone they knew, someone they loved. Two thirds of the village died over the next 14 months, but their capacity to hold strong together set a model for the rest of Northern England that helped slow the, the transmission of the plague throughout the rest of England. They remind us today that we, each of us are connected to lineages of incredible courage, generosity, and capacity to hold both heaven and hell at the same time. Thank you so much for all you have done and are doing. I wish you well. I wish you safety and health. Liana, thank you on behalf of all of the great work you are doing to hold all of us together in the village that is our nonprofit village. Thank you, Maria. Such an honor to be here.